The hottest topic of today is Afghanistan. Let's talk about Afghanistan from a strategic perspective. I'm Dr. Christopher Larson, a veteran of the U.S. Army Infantry, founder of One Shepherd Leadership Institute, and author of Small Unit Tactical Doctrine. Afghanistan is all over the news, more specifically the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan and our rather embarrassing, shameful abandonment of our embassy. I'd like to avoid emotional triggering words. I recognize what, um, what is happening right now. Um, I understand that uh, this will put many people in a whole myriad of different feelings and emotions. Um, and so I don't want to dismiss that. But this does seem like a, an opportunity to discuss um, a strategic perspective of warfare that we don't often get to discuss here. Let's discuss first the sunk cost fallacy. The sunk cost fallacy says, well, I'm doing something that won't be fruitful, but I'm going to continue doing it. I'm going to continue doing it because I've invested so much of my time and resources in this, so uh, let's continue doing this. That might strike you as a bit of madness, and yet at the same time, I'm going to say that, um, that you know, almost every human has experienced this at some level, whether it was a financial investment, a romantic investment, um, you know, a, a social political investment, up to and including warfare. The sunk cost fallacy is to say this. Let's say you've decided one Sunday morning you are going to walk um, six blocks away and you're going to go to the donut store. You're going to get some hot coffee and some donuts because that's what you want this Sunday morning. It's a beautiful day. You start walking and just a little over halfway there, let's say you're coming up on the end of the fourth block and a couple walks past you and that couple is saying rather to, uh, you know, loudly to each other, I can't believe our favorite donut shop is closed on a Sunday. Who closes on a Sunday? And you stop them and you say, wait, the donut shop that I'm going to, that one, I was just going to get some hot coffee and some wonderful donuts. They're closed today. The couple says, yeah, we just came from there. They're closed. And so they walk on down the street. Now, you have several options here. One, you can convince yourself that they're crazy, that they're not talking about the same thing that you are, that they're trying to deceive you. But I think most of us would say, oh, and crestfallen, we would say, well, I'm going back home. Why would you walk another two blocks to turn around and walk six home? Yes, you've invested that four blocks, but unless you have an ulterior motive, well, I just needed to walk 12 blocks today for my, you know, I don't know, to get enough steps on my fit watch or whatever it is. Unless there's another motivation for you to do so, you see where I'm going with this. It doesn't make sense for you to continue walking to the donut shop that you know that you have confirmed reasonably uh, that it is not going to produce for you. So you turn around and you go home. Now that's on one hand of this entire argument from a strategic perspective. There's a lot of argument to be made there. Let me also get out of the way right here and right now that I am not discussing 2002 when America invaded Afghanistan. That was a decision. Um, do I agree with it? It's immaterial. It's in the past. I can't change it. Uh, to be frank, I was a bit of a fence sitter on both the invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq in 2002 and in 2003. Uh, I could see some merit of some arguments. I could. I conceded that. I could also see arguments that said, no, there's nothing to be gained here. Um, that we should seek other solutions. And I didn't even necessarily mean peaceful. I could have, we could have sought violent solutions, bombing campaigns that ran for years and years and years and never f stepped foot on the ground. There were a lot of options open to us. And I am not saying that I was right or wrong because frankly, I was a fence sitter. That means I didn't make up my mind. Now, if you had asked me in 1991, 
Um, or if you had asked me when the Soviets pulled out of Afghanistan or in 1991 in you know, the Persian Gulf War in Iraq, I would have had quite a different answer. And I think I would have assertively said yes. Um, but in 2002 and 2003, I wasn't convinced that was the way to go. That is not what I'm discussing today. I'm not discussing, per se, whether or not we should have gone into Afghanistan. Instead, I'll draw your attention to a RAND study, the RAND Think Group, and they released a monograph in 2010 called How Insurgencies End. Now, in that monograph, they, um, and you, this is available to you online, um, they researched 89 insurgencies. Indeed, half a dozen or so of those insurgencies were still ongoing as of the publication in 2010. So, and, and some of the insurgencies go back centuries. So they really have a lot of data points, even though there's only 89 insurgencies that they're looking at, there's many different things of each that they're looking at, and it presented quite a bit of data. They conclude that it takes a minimum of two and a half generations. A generation is, for clarity, 20 years. So they say it takes a minimum of 50 years. Um, that resonates with me. I am the son of a soldier and my uncles were soldiers and Green Berets and everything you can think of in Laos and Cambodia and Thailand and Vietnam. Um, and in the wake of the collapse in 1975, uh, the collapse of South Vietnam and the overrunning and the evacuation of the U.S. Embassy. There was a lot of soul searching. This was devastating. It was devastating to the United States military. It was devastating to the U.S. Um, prestige. It was devastating to trust amongst our allies as to whether America was really the leader um, and really was a military powerhouse. It, there was a lot of questions, and that's the least of it. Frankly, it was far more devastating to Vietnam and to the people we left behind and to the people that were persecuted, prosecuted, and murdered by the communists. So America's uh, image, uh, self-image, and self-confidence, while important and having long-lasting implications well into the next couple of decades, um, frankly, the humanitarian concern of our withdrawal from South Vietnam was far greater. And so my uncles and my father, you know, there was a great deal of soul searching and there were many nights where they would sit around after dinner and they would discuss things. And my takeaway from that was they kept saying to me, look, if you're going to go to war, if you're going to go to a war with any nation by which you intend to inv invade and hold territory, then it takes three generations to win. That's what I heard in the late 70s and early 80s for years. The RAND study, How Insurgencies End, in 2010, vindicates my father and my uncles. It says, yes, in fact, uh, the, the new established rule of thumb is one generation, again, 20 years, one generation to win the war, one generation to win the economics, and that is to become, you know, independent. And one generation more to establish an expectation of representative government. And so you go, well, hold on, 60 years. Well, let's talk about that. Let's, let's throw a few historical examples out where we can actually flesh this out a little better. And I'm not just going to stick with insurgencies. For me, the bigger issue here is you know, if it's a raid, if it's an air bombing, if it's a quick SEAL raid into a, a you know, naval port or a um, ranger raid into an airport, and then we withdraw, there's some legitimacy to that kind of military action as well. But I'm not discussing even that. I'm saying going in, invading a nation, occupying territory, and controlling the masses. If you are doing this, you need to stay 60 years. And if you're not staying 60 years, there are some hard consequences, very unappealing. So we really need to be careful about choosing when we go to war in the first place. So let's talk about a couple. Panama. America invades Panama in 1903 and we leave in 1999 and we were there for 96 years. Philippines, before that, in 1898, 
we invade the Philippines. It was a horrible um, insurgency and insurrection and everything else you want to say. And then there was a global war or two involved in that time because we don't leave until 1992. So that's 94 years. Now you can look at them and say, well, maybe they're not the economic and military powerhouses of the world, but they're not a burden on their neighbors either. And they tend to, on an even keel, have a pretty peaceful, um, uh, you know, legal representation in government, right? So I think that there are certain uh, measures of success. If we look at the four measures of success, it's called DIME, and it's diplomacy, information, military, and economics. And when you look at the Panama and you look at the Philippines, you say, yeah, they're not doing too bad for themselves. We could have had more success. Let me show you. We invaded Italy in 43, and we're still there today. Yeah, 78 years. We invaded uh, Germany uh, and Japan in 45, and we are still in both of them today, 76 years later. And I think really the crowning achievement here, while Italy uh, does very, very well in, in its own right, Germany and Japan are economic powerhouses. You look at uh, diplomacy, information, and economics, and they wield this expertly globally. Their military, yeah, pretty, pretty substantial uh, in a defensive posture, certainly substantial. I wouldn't say a huge world player at all. Very, very regional players and not particularly aggressive at that. You really want to see where we win. You'd have to say South Korea. We go in in 1950 and we're still there today. So what is that, 71 years? And it's amazing to me that not only at the conclusion of the UN invasion, the only successful military invasion the United Nations has really ever had, um, and it goes from 50 to 53, and ever since 1953, right up to documentaries made today, people wring their hands, particularly American historians and military personnel, and they say, oh, was it, a, was it a success or was it a failure? I mean, we didn't take North Korea, but we did, and then we lost it, and this, and then what does it mean? I offer a different perspective that says something like South Korea for American involvement has been something akin to winning the lottery. It is unmitigated success. First off, if you go back to 1953, you will see that in the United States media, newspapers, they spoke of Koreans as if they were subhuman apes. They, they, they apologized on their behalf and said, well, the Japanese have ravished them so long and so thoroughly that, uh, that Koreans will never be um, full, you know, empowered, independent players on a global scale ever again. Now, this is what was being said in the 50s and the 60s, but you start to see that change around economically in the 70s and their, their own miracle of pulling themselves up by the bootstraps, and then in the 80s, and then by the 1990s, they're passing they're passing everybody. They're one of the economic powerhouses of the world, um, one of the most peaceful nations of the world, one of the most plugged in, technologically advanced nations of the world. They lead the world in shipbuilding. They're a major uh, car manufacturers. Um, they're just very, very wealthy, very peaceful, very capable. And let's go back to dime. Diplomacy. Yes, they wield that globally. Information, again, plugged in, wielding it globally. Economics, yes. Military, really our staunchest ally of everybody I just mentioned. We have strong allies, and I don't mean to disparage them or their contributions, but when you look at South Korea, they have been one of our staunchest military allies um, in the years since 1950. So I have to say it's a screaming success. You know, you look at that old uh, picture online that has uh, South Korea all lit up at night that's being taken by, you know, the space shuttle or one of the satellites anyway, and then you look at North Korea and it's all dark and people say, yeah, South Korea is an island. And virtually that's true. So if you ever wonder, hey, did we have success in South Korea? I would suggest look at that picture on Google. Take a look at it at nighttime from you know outer space looking at South and North Korea as a comparison. And if you can't conclude, it's far more than simply electricity. 
then you're missing. You, you don't know the own, your own history. There we go. 78 years, 76 years, 71 years, um, 96 years, 94 years. You see where we've had success every single time we've stayed three generations or longer. What about places where we didn't stay 60 years or longer? Well, in Vietnam, we, we invaded in 1965 and we pulled out all ground troops by 1972, seven years. Vietnam fell just three years later. In Lebanon, we went in in 1983 in Beirut, had a nasty bombing resulting in a lot of dead U.S. Uh, troops, and we pulled out immediately. Lebanon never recovered. Lebanon, by the way, used to be the Paris of, of the Mediterranean. Um, people don't realize that. Somalia, another country that had its heyday, it was actually quite advanced at different times. Um, you know, if you look at the 1950s and 60s, and we go in in Somalia in 1992, and we're pulled out by 1994. Two years. Two years, and they've never recovered. Vietnam, Lebanon, Somalia. How about Iraq? Do you know what Iraq looked like in 1975? From 1950s, 60s, up through the mid-70s, women wore miniskirts, high heels, and drove cars to the universities. That's not just true of Iraq, that's true of Afghanistan. People forget, and we look at Afghanistan ravaged by one war after another from the late 70s up to now, and we say, well, they're subhuman, they're really just primitive, you know, apes. Are they? Because they've enjoyed a lot of sophistication. I mean, and they're an older society than we are. It can't even compare. They're thousands of years older than us. And they've contribute, contributed greatly in many different ways to humanity. And again, going all the way up to 1975, before they were attacked and invaded by one force after another, women wore miniskirts and high heels and drove themselves to their university classes. So I reject this idea that... Um, that in Vietnam and Lebanon and Somalia and Iraq and Afghanistan, that they're somehow incapable as humans. We said that about many different places, not the least of which was the Koreans, and we were wrong. I know I'm painting a rather simplistic picture. I get that. There are more factors here at play than just one. But I think on a strategic level, because those, generally speaking, are down at operational and tactical levels, on a strategic level, the critical factor is this. When you invade a country, their grandchildren and great-grandchildren will attend American universities. And if that's not the case, if you don't have a 60-year plan to recovery, to economic powerhouse, to being a global player in diplomacy, information, military might, and economics. If you don't have a plan how to develop that conquered territory into those um, coercions of power as success over the next 60 years, then you have no moral right or ethical right to invade. And that's where we are today.